Push it back some more. Your video as well. Do you want me to scoot in or out? How's that? More? I didn't realize that part. So I'm going to go live in three, two, one. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. Our guest today is Mark Baggert. Mark, thank you for being here today. You ready to be great today? Yeah, thank you. Mark is the CEO of Fabio Lingua, a language learning platform for kids based on interactive children's stories. Fabio Lingua is rethinking the way second languages are introduced and reinforced, especially for young children whose brains are actively wiring to all new language input. Applying stories and reading is a timeless practice to learning our native language. And Family Lingua believes that it is also nationally effective in single language acquisition. Family Lingua uses technology, delightful stories, and game design to create an engaging and effective language learning experience. Mark, thanks for being here today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's great to be here. So Mark, you're, you've been on several boards for nonprofits, co-ops, and startups. What's the difference between being a board member? Each one is like is certain different responsibilities or is it all the same? Uh, well, I mean, I think there's a thread that's the same, which is that you want to be, you know, responsible and accountable and proactively support uh, the business, but, uh, or the nonprofit as it may be. And I think the difference is that on, you know, in corporations, um, when they're, you know, being able to balance sort of the, uh, fiduciary responsibility to the shareholders to also providing strategy to the business um, so that it can grow. So, uh, you know, with, with a nonprofit, it's, it's not as much uh, about uh, growth, growth. It's, it's uh, very much about stewardship. It's about how you can support them often with uh, fundraising and networks, et cetera, um, so that they can expand their mission. Um, <clears throat> with a corporation, depending upon sort of, you know, why that particular company um, thought you would be a particularly good fit for their business, you sort of lean in um, to that area of expertise. So what's the difference between a nonprofit and a for-profit for -profit business? Is it really just a tax, tax, the tax things, right? Oh, yes. Um, and, and in the past, it's also been sort of the, the, the social mission associated with that particular nonprofit. Although now what you're seeing with corporations is that um, it's, it's important for uh, corporations to also demonstrate that they have uh, some sort of mission to help improve, uh, you know, the, the society and mankind. I think that's what their shareholders care to see. And certainly the employees that they're attracting to their businesses want to know that they're working for an ethical organization that has a higher mission. So lately, it's, it's very important for business to be ethical, right? In the past, maybe not so much. You know, you heard the horror stories of Enron, you know, in the past. Right. Coming down more ethical. I mean, of course, this is a good thing, mm -hmm. but how, how does an um, employee or a founder or someone make sure the company's being doing the right thing? Because sometimes what I think is right, not the same thing you think is right, correct? Yeah, that's true. That's true. So, you know, you, I guess you need to be guided by your own particular moral compass um, and, you know, why I think, you know, why you're starting that business in the first place. The mission of a company um, is increasingly important uh, to be able to attract the type of talent to your team, to your endeavor, uh, to your project, so that you know you have the, the you have the, the best chance to succeed with a talented team. At the same time, um, your customer base, which is e equally uh, critical in the growth of, of any organization, is is also wants to is increasingly wants to be aligned with products services organizations that have a, you know, a mission um, that uh, is, is, is beneficial to society. So, um, and now even, even you're seeing investors um, who have uh, social impact in mind when they're making their investments. So yeah, really this has to be a formative foundational part of deciding to start a business. So Mark, you've had several companies in the past 
Can you talk about how you attract the right talent to your team? Sure. Um, you know, I, I think it's uh, a lot of it is, is, is the kind of person that you are and being able to, um, you know, demonstrate that um, you're a sort of compassionate, empathic um, uh, individual or leader uh, who wants uh, their team uh, to succeed and that anybody that you bring on board, uh, you want to provide a platform, an opportunity for success. So when, I, uh, when I'm trying to attract talent, um, one, I'm, I'm trying to identify what their particular superpower is that's going to help my company um, and the fit uh, that that superpower has. And then I, I, want to, I want to emphasize to that individual that um, I'm going to do my best and we as an organization are going to do our best to give them the opportunity to use that superpower uh, to the best of their ability within our organization. Because I think that's what motivates and excites um, talented individuals. In addition to the previous point we made, which is um, the, the company's mission. So Mark, you know, in the startup world, you know, this, this, this thing, this hype, you know, raise money, raise money. But I think I could be wrong, the stats only like one to 5% of people actually raise money, right? So why, to me, it's a disconnect, right? Yeah. You know, this hype, you know, raise money, raise money. It makes it like crunch base, all these organizations, why see economics like everyone raises money, right? Reality is very, very hard. Why, why this hype over raising money when it's probably not necessary? Well, I mean, I, I, I think a lot of times it is necessary because you, you, to get a company properly off the ground and to get it the, the type of uh, inertia that it needs um, to succeed, um, you, it, it's, it's, it's hard uh, to uh, bootstrap forever. And different types of companies, different types of um, uh, industries require different levels of capital. Um, and in the software space, for example, um, there is a sort of R&D and a build and a development time before you go to market and before you're able to, to, to begin generating revenue. And that, that requires money, that requires capital. And uh, typically uh, your founding team alone um, cannot get a, uh, a business all the way to the point where they've got uh, essentially you know, product market fit or it's rare. So I would argue that yes, you know, raising capital is a is 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 very much a predictor of success. Not entirely, but a, a predictor. Um, a, the raising capital, though, however, is not a be all and end all. And I think sometimes um, what you see in the press is uh, a celebration of uh, fundraising versus a celebration of. Um, of the product success or the company's success or the number of customers that it's uh, drawing or satisfying. So yes, there's a, there's a cult of fundraising um, that uh, sometimes, you know, goes too far and, and gives the wrong message that that's sort of a be all and end all. So Mark, let's suppose a, a founder's out there, a co-founder team, whatever, they raise a seed round, they raise an A round. And correct me if I'm wrong, but if you raise A round, that means someone for that venture capital firm is going to have a uh, have a, a a chair on your board, or, a, a, be on your board of directors, correct? Yes, typically, yes. What should a founder expect from this board or person on their board? Do you, you know you always hear horror stories, hear great stories, like you know, hear like board members or VCs that give them a lot of values uh, and like yeah. vice versa, right? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a mixed bag. Um, uh, what what you should expect is um, is is somebody that's going to uh, be both um, supportive and helpful in in your mission and, and in developing your strategy, but also somebody that's uh, going to um, going to push you and have the the type of oversight and require the type of transparency where you're held accountable um, by someone other than yourself or your or your co-founders. So you have a responsibility um, to um, to to shareholders, and they represent that particular shareholder. So that's also a side of it. I, I, I think it you know, comes down to the individual board member. I think even within you know, particular VC firms, there's going to be certain partners that will sit on your board that provide more value. And then there's going to be others that are, are really there because they're uh, performing a, a, a function and sort of ticking a box for the organization. So of course, you know, the best case scenario, a founder or co-founder team is going to have like three, four, five, you know, offers. 
But usually for most people, they might have one offer, right? Mm -hmm. But it's, I think it's very important and, and for them to, to kind of pick the right VC from, right? Because once you take money, you can't fire them, right? Once you have the money, that's pretty much <laughs> like a 10-year relationship, right? Yes, yes. You know, a lot's been written and, and talked about this. And so, you know, it's... If, if you have the, the, the good fortune, the background, the success, the pedigree that you have a, you have multiple options um, from the venture capital community, um, you know, if, if your underlying business is as successful, uh, that warrants uh, multiple options, then you're in a, you're in a great spot and you definitely um, need to choose wisely. Uh, who's going to be the, the sort of best partner because they really are partners long term. But the fact is, is that um, a lot of companies, perhaps most companies, don't have, uh, you know, the benefit of multiple options. And so therefore, you know, they, they need the capital to, to grow, to survive. And um, don't, they, they have to sort of, uh, they have to manage with <laughs> whatever particular investor is interested in them. Um, versus getting to pick the investor. So next, you, you, you've had some success raising in front of yourself. Mm -hmm. Any tips or quote unquote tricks you can pass on? <laughs> um, it's been different every time I've, I've raised capital. Um, and a lot of it has to do with whether or not um, your particular uh, subject matter, your particular market, your particular industry is uh, in you know, is, is something that VCs are attracted to at that particular time um, and that they see and they have sort of a playbook behind your success and you're sort of hitting the, the metrics or the benchmarks, uh, KPIs as they call them, that um, designate you as a potential successful business. Um, those times are, are uh, it, it's easier to have a conversation um, when your business fits um, their particular uh, model. Um, it's more challenging um, when you uh, have something that is a little bit out of left field um, and, and therefore is a new concept, a new idea, a, a different space they haven't considered. At that point, you need to go find the VCs that are, are lateral thinkers themselves and that take um, risk and investment on sort of contrarian uh, concepts or ideas. So, uh, you know, uh, a lot of, uh, and, and there's, there's less of those than there are the, the VCs who follow up more of a strict playbook. <laughs> so, so, you know, uh, my, my advice would be to understand your business so well and to understand where it fits in sort of the current construct or matri matrices of venture capital interests. And then to go find either, oh, and this includes angel investors as well. And then go um, do your homework and identify those particular investors that have uh, experience in your particular space or experience in investing in contrarian ideas and spend your time um, trying to, to, to get to know them, to network with them and to, um, and to get on their radar and convince them of your value uh, versus sort of this, you know, more of a shotgun approach, um, which I think you can end up spending your wheels for a long time. So Mark, you read some places people tell you, you know, never code email or code call a VC. Other people say, well, no, code email them because they need deal flow, right? What's your take on that? I actually think that it's always better to get a warm introduction or to find a way to be introduced by um, a uh, fellow investor um, or, you know, what, I, what I've found to be really um, valuable is a, another entrepreneur um, that uh, will, has, had, um, has, has, has had success or is having success with that particular investor invested in their entity or in their business because that investor values that uh, entrepreneur's perspective and it's the, the warmest most genuine introduction that, that I believe you can get. From one uh, investor to another investor, uh, unless they are you know, invested in your particular deal, uh, then it's, uh, it, it's more of a challenge. 
So yeah, I, I'd say fellow entrepreneurs is, is, is the best way to get an introduction to a VC. So Mark, you know, across the Bay Area, Seattle, Austin, Boston, New York City, like the quote unquote hotspots of VC. If you live on those places, kind of it probably it won't be easy, easy, but it's not as hard, right? Suppose there's someone listening there from, we'll say, I don't know, Wichita, Kansas. Yeah. How do they even get in? How do they even start? Like they know no one. <laughs> right. I, well, you know, Wichita, Kansas in the Midwest is an example that um, there are um, more and more venture capitalists that are serving um, the, uh, different parts of, of the United States. Um, there are funds um, that are specifically addressing the opportunities in the um, less, lesser, I guess, uh, traveled uh, startup arenas that exist from, you know, um, the Canada down, uh, down to Texas. Um, it, is, it is true that venture capitalists tend to invest proximate to their particular headquarters. So you're going to get more Austin VCs investing in Austin companies and Texas companies, and the same thing on the West Coast. But you know, I, I've uh, in the last six months had great conversations with in, venture capitalists that were either based in you know Omaha or actually in Kansas, et cetera. So I think that there's a growth in those areas to serve those markets. And if I was in those markets starting a company in Wichita, Kansas, those are exactly the people I'd go talk to. Um, I would have conversations there because I think that they're trying to look out for those particular companies and they're trying to create a, an, an ecosystem um, for those type of companies to exist in those markets. Mark, so from your point of view, why are some founders successful and others not? You know, and success being whatever you want it to be. Well, I've been a both a successful founder and an unsuccessful founder uh, in the ventures that I've uh, been involved in. So uh, I, I, you know, I believe that, um, you know, in hindsight, I can look back at the failures that I've had and pick them apart and identify the mistakes I made. Um, and in hindsight, when I look at the um, successes that I've had, you know, I can see a couple of things. I can see that I made, a, a, you know, a few more good decisions than bad. But I also saw that um, sort of the market moved in my direction um, and that I had sort of tailwinds uh, around the business um, that were part of a sort of a macro or even micro uh, industry climate that helped support that business. So Mark, talk about, I think a lot of entrepreneurs, they start off, they like, they think it's a sprint, right? I'll be a millionaire in six months, whatever. Yeah. Can you talk about how actually the long journey is? It is a super long journey. And I, and I believe that um, the, the first part of the journey, when you're pushing that boulder up the hill, uh, is the longest, feels the longest, um, is uh, particularly difficult because you haven't tasted sort of success for the first time. Um, but that certainly can last years before you finally begin to taste success. You finally get um, the, uh, the, the, the uh, sort of mystical product market fit. Uh, you finally have customers that are, that are running to you and investors that are running to you versus what it feels like when you're first pushing that boulder up the hill, which is that you're doing everything you can to, to sort of grab reach out to them and, and get them interested and curious and raise awareness around who you are. Um, but I believe like anytime I ever uh, start a, a business or get involved in a, um, a, a very early stage business, and I mean early stage, like within the first year or so of development, I'm anticipating it's a seven to 10 year um, process um, or certainly a, a, and that at each stage, there's going to be really challenging, difficult moments. Um, however, I still believe that that first two or three years is sort of psychologically and emotionally um, the most difficult. So Mark, Kevin said that, you know, you, you're, you're a co-founder team with yourself or two other people. Like you say, you can't do it by yourself, right? You got to bring on people to help you, right? So what have you done in the past, like, to bring people in and having to work for equity, right? Like I tell people all the time, well, I'm gonna give you like X amount of equity, yeah. but that's the same as me telling you, you know, the pot of gold that's yours too, right? It's probably not gonna come true. So how do you convince people to 
not only share your vision, but, you know, quote unquote, sacrifice so much. Yes. I mean, I think, you know, being a founder is, um, is, is you have to be excellent, uh, essentially at, at sales. Um, and sales is not only selling, um, you know, your, your product, your service, but also s selling the concept and the vision that you have for your business. So I believe those to, you know, certainly at the early stage to be a successful founder um, and to uh, attract talented people to your, your business, you have to be um, not only uh, have the, the, the type of vision that um, resonates um, with, uh, with, with certain people, but you also have to demonstrate that kind of passion, uh, commitment, um, and, um, and, and generally be the kind of person that others want to work with, uh, for, for, for you to be able to, to, to convince other people, talented people to leave, um, or eschew, you know, large income paying jobs for a slice of equity and below market, you know, compensation. <laughs> They always tell people, be the type of boss that you don't want to work for, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it amazes how many people don't do that. No, no, absolutely. I, you know, I also, I, I have this uh, sort of mental image that if you're, if you're going to be sort of a founder or CEO of a business, it's, it's kind of a reverse pyramid in terms of your organizational structure. If you want, you, you need to be at the bottom sort of supporting um, your two sort of founder colleagues, executives who then support uh, the, the vice president group and all the way up until, you know, um, uh, into every single employee in the organization. And if you think of it that way, if you think of you're there to sort of serve, um, serve your team, serve your mission, uh, serve your shareholders, um, then what you're doing is you're sort of enabling these uh, other parties, these other stakeholders to be the best they can be. So Mark, you the if someone's the CEO, founder, co-founder of the company, of course mm -hmm. you're gonna be positive for the vision, but how transparent should you be with the members of the team when things go bad? Um, I think that there's I, you know, I, I always err on the side of transparency. I, I believe that um, if you've done a good job recruiting and you've done a good job um, building a team and you've attracted um, sort of adults, uh, mature individuals. Uh, to uh, to your team, and so therefore you can speak to them um, in a mature way with full transparency. And so, if you've done a good job in 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 recruiting them and and all, uh, communicating sort of the potential and the risk and the ups and downs that they're going to experience in a in a in a company like this, then when you bring them, you know, bad news, uh, they they should be able to handle it. Um, and if for whatever reason they can't handle that, then perhaps you know they're not. Uh, it's not a good fit uh, for uh, for the organization because uh, you know, frankly, there's there's going to be a lot of ups and downs. Um, and so you know, the first time you have to communicate bad news, you have to recognize there's there's going to be other times when you're going to run into um, obstacles or stumble or wherever. And and you just kind of need to know that you've got a team that's that's sort of committed and has enough grit to get through those stumbles. Mark, when you bring on new members of your team, can you talk about the points of not bringing on, on clones of yourself? <laughs> um, that's, a, that's, that's a great question. I, for me, it's really easy because I'm um, very aware of um, my you know, weaknesses or the areas in which I don't have um, you know, a particular skill set. And so, and I also like to run extremely lean. I like, I like for our team to all have uh, their individual superpowers and for them to command sort of that particular team around that. So, um, you know, I think it would be a, a real waste of a resource to have anybody that um, replicated my particular skills and superpower. I'd be spending money on something that I didn't need to spend money on. And I wouldn't be improving in an area where I could. So Mark, you have some, you have some extensive experience in China. Can you talk about how you got involved in China? Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that was a, that was a great experience, formative experience to my sort of entrepreneurial um, career. So back um, in late, the late nineties, early two thousands, I uh, moved out to Shanghai to help 
start a wireless, um, one of the first wireless application developers um, in China. And um, we, uh, I was living in, in London at the time and decided to sort of leave my job and take this, uh, this risk and went there sort of sight unseen with my co-founders, um, two of which were uh, Chinese natives. Um, and so I was a part of the sort of original, I was part of the found, founding team that helped sort of get things off the ground. And then we split the company and uh, I went off to help run a consumer wireless sort of subscription application business, which is where I got the experience that I am now applying to Fabulingua. But it was, it was, it was amazing. It was the, it was the wild west back then. Um, you know, there was uh, very few uh, startups at the time. Of course, there's been an explosion in the following decade. And so we were, we were definitely learning, um, you know, on the fly. Uh, and I learned how to become, you know, a chief financial officer. Um, I learned how to become a chief operating officer. I learned how to build partnerships with, um, you know, international um, content and media companies uh, that we could bring into China. So it, it, was, it was fantastic. And at the same time, I got to see uh, sort of Shanghai evolve sort of around my eyes. It went from being sort of a, a backwater uh, city uh, in, in you know, the 80s and 90s to being this sort of glorious metropolis that it, that it is now. I haven't been back in about you know, eight years or so. I'd love to see how it's evolved even more so. But um, the other cool thing about it is when you're over there, right? You, 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 there weren't many Westerners at the time. So um, one, I was extremely tall and always pointed, that was always pointed out, which is funny. But two, um, you know, I really got to Im immerse myself in, in the culture. There weren't a lot of different Western places to go. Um, the expat group that, that was over there, we formed tight bonds and I'm still friends with them since then. But um, that certainly, you know, taught me about how the startup lifestyle can be, you know, wild and woolly with a lot of ups and downs. And it helped sort of, I guess, develop the, the type of uh, sort of stamina and grit that I have now. <laughs> So do you, do you speak Chinese? I, I can speak what I would consider to be sort of, you know, taxi level uh, Mandarin. Okay. Um, I can get around, I can uh, converse with my colleagues, but uh, you wouldn't, I wouldn't want to negotiate a deal in, in Mandarin or, or uh, have to uh, uh, proof a contract. Uh, <laughs> and how long were you over there? Six years. Six years. Um, yeah. Any plans going back to visit anytime soon? Absolutely. Uh, I'd like to take my kids, you know, they've never been to China and they're, you know, getting up to sort of, you know, 10 years old. So I think that'd be a really amazing experience. So is entrepreneurship the same here as it is in China or is it different based on cultures and other factors? I mean, I think it's the, I think it's the same. Um, I think that uh, certainly now um, there's a substantial culture of, of um, entrepreneurship in China. I think that, you know, they've been entrepreneurial for hundreds and hundreds of years. So um from 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 my perspective, uh, yes, it it requires the the same uh, sort of agility, uh, flexibility, grit, um, you know, emotional stamina um, uh, over there as it as it as it does here, uh, and you know, there's there's paths that have been paved in the regulatory construct, um, just as there are here in the United States, um, that where you can sort of learn from past. Uh, entrepreneurs and past successes uh, that you can apply that can help sort of steady the process a little bit. Um, but, you know, in the end, I think entrepreneurship, you know, all over the world requires a, a, a certain type of, you know, as I said, agility, flexibility, um, uh, stamina, uh, grit, and just, you know, you have to be willing to, to, to work your way through the ups and downs if you're going to be successful. So Mark, I think here in the United States, we like to think you know, entrepreneurial is, is you know, we're, we're better able to innovate or that kind of stuff. Is that because of the government we have or is that more based on the person you think? Well, you know, it's interesting because um, if you look at, you know, I, I think a lot of it has to do with the uh, particular sort of economic cycle, uh, generational cycle that we are in, you know, vis-a-vis other countries. So, I mean, if you're going to compare where the United States is relative to China, I think as as China um, has emerged 
uh, as being, you know, an embracing um, sort of their form of, of, of capitalism from a period of time when, when that, that wasn't um, really a, um, a, a, an option for them, that there was a, a, a tremendous movement towards sort of entrepreneurialism and, and starting um, companies and they were leaping technologies, et cetera. In the United States, you know, up until this year, um, there's been a decline in um, new business starts, um, small business starts. And it's only been since um, COVID that uh, over the last two quarters, we've seen a surge in uh, business formation. So, you know, that I think very much can be attributed to the economic reality of uh, that certain citizens or people in the United States are finding them where they feel like, um, it's a, they've got a better chance or be, there's better risk reward to starting a business now than there was in the past. So Mark, how has COVID affected your, your startup so far? We've uh, actually, uh, you know, been a beneficiary uh, of, of, of COVID. Um, and, you know, I, I say that uh, with uh, humility because it's, 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 it's a horrible situation um, that overall, how, however, there has been a, um, certainly an accelerated adoption of digital learning um, since COVID, since we've had so much more, you know, staying at, at extended home sort of time um, for families, particularly um, if you look at uh, school closures, our, the, the, the addressable market that we're looking at are kids between sort of age two up to age 10, so through elementary school, and these schools were closed, uh, you know, in uh, the spring and then have been closed for the most part in the fall. And a lot of teachers, um, even if you're in a hybrid model, a lot of teachers have been looking for um, solutions that they could uh, deliver, administer, and manage on both, uh, both at home and also in school. And we've got a particular solution like that. And at the same time, Parents are looking for more productive ways or uses of time for their kids, given they're at home so much. They're not going to the soccer practices and the ballet and the violin and the music and after school. And once and so they 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 want they don't just want them to sit on YouTube um, or to be in sort of you know uh, any other uh, sort of social setting that might not be as sort of safe as productive as they like. So. Um, our, our sort of fun story-based, you know, language learning and games um, provides a really sort of productive, engaging, entertaining alternative. So Mark, how did the idea for your company come about? Can you talk about the origin story? Sure, sure. Um, my uh, co-founder, who is uh, also my wife, Leslie, uh, Leslie Omania Beggart, she uh, was raised um, outside of Barcelona, Spain um, in a Spanish speaking, obviously uh, environment, but an English speaking household. Her mother was Norwegian, her father was a sort of Venezuelan, Venezuelan national. So she grew up in a multilingual environment and then went to uh, university uh, in England at uh, uh, Oxford undergrad and then Cambridge master. She studied psychology and social anthropology. Um, and then uh, for all of her really professional career, um, and personal and academic, she benefited from um, speaking more than one language. Um, I also, you know, there's now science behind so the cognitive development benefits of speaking a second language and the emotional development benefits of speaking a second language, such as empathy. So when our child um, was, um, was born, we wanted to make sure that we gave them a foundation in a second language, and Spanish was the language that we sort of chose. So Leslie um, was looking for all of the different solutions and tools to help support, you know, Spanish in, at, for our child and could not find anything that was um, anything more than sort of a token, um, unengaging sort of solution, um, you know, unless it was a heavy lift, like sending them to immersion school. So she, um, so, so she said, uh, you know, none of this is moving the needle, just learning um, you know, your fruits or your colors is not going to make you fluent in another language. You need to be a more of a holistic approach. So she said, look, you know, we read children's stories 
in their native language, English, to them to expand their vocabulary and their literacy and to help them, you know, really gain a, a broader perspective on, on language in the world. Um, we should be doing the same in foreign languages because their little minds are naturally wiring to language input um, until they're sort of 10, 11, 12 years old. Their ability to acquire language is so simple. So she developed a method through foreign language children's stories and reading them that um, allows for a child to essentially subconsciously develop, we call it invisible learning, um, subconsciously develop uh, skills in that particular language simply by following and enjoying a story. So to them, it's fun, it's engaging, it's a story, it's entertaining. And now that we put it on tablets and phones, of course, the kids are even more attracted to that. Um, but what's happening is that they are developing language skills, they're developing comprehension, they're developing pronunciation, um, they're developing sort of uh, grammatical uh, reference as well. So that's, a, that's, how we, uh, that's how we came up with the idea um, we then researched uh, sort of what was out there and thought, could this be a, a business? Um, and saw that, you know, frankly, it's, it's a white space. There are fantastic uh, solutions at the adult level, such as Duolingo, um, you know, Babel, even old Rosetta Stone. Uh, but in the children's language learning space, there's um, very little uh, that is uh, effective um, and so right now we're starting by teaching Spanish to English language speakers, but we're able to take our stories and our platform and really move that into any particular language. So next we'll be teaching English um, to as a second language to Spanish speakers. So that's how it started. So that's a subject. A, a couple of days ago, I did an interview with someone. He's a military brat. He yeah. grew up in England right. and his favorite city was Barcelona. So. <laughs> yeah, it's an amazing city, right? Um, and when she grew up there, they, they, they didn't speak as much Catalan as they do now. Um, but, um, but yes, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a fantastic city. So Mark, why, why Spanish? Why not Chinese or French or something else? Yeah, it's, it's because of Leslie. It's because of where she grew up. And that was the, it was the um, sort of smoothest path. Um, we could support the kids' language. And so then, you know, when it came to building the, the product or building our company, the, the, the first language we started with was the one we knew best. We knew the process uh, around um, the method uh, for teaching Spanish to English speakers. Um, and then, then uh, you know, so it was the, it's the easiest one for us to really sort of hone and get right. And once we've got it right, which we're, you know, working on every day, um, then we will have uh, essentially the, the method, the process, the, 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 the tools to take that to, to other languages that have sort of a similar construct and can have, uh, can build similar value. So Mark, can you talk about your method of how you're gonna pick the second language, third language, fourth language, on and on, you know, cause I have to assume you wanna, you wanna eventually do all languages, correct? Yeah, that's a really good question. So it's what's, you know, best suited to the format and, and moving from uh, Spanish to then teaching English by essentially flipping, you know, English to Spanish, Spanish to English, is the most logical next step. Then uh, looking at uh, other, uh, you know, essentially romance languages that have a similar construct will work um, as sort of natural next steps. The, the, the cool thing is, is that we've had a lot of teachers and parents who've reached out to us and said, can I translate these books for you? Can I create, um, you know, Fabulingua um, German? Or can I uh, create, a, there's a teacher uh, in, in the Midwest who wants to translate all of our stories to Mandarin because she wants to use them teaching her Mandarin class. So, you know, the, the validation from teachers is fantastic. They love the approach. They love the method. It's intuitive. It's using, you know, all of the, it's the sweet spot of brain science right now, the brain science, which says you need to maximize the amount of comprehensible input in your language, um, uh, in, in, in language instruction for ideal acquisition. You need to make it. Um, you need to make it uh, fun so that there's no anxiety or stress in the learning process. And then, you know, the third element or ingredient is that you need to get to these kids early because their brains are sponges and they can learn languages um, so much more um, easily than uh, at that at a young age and provide a strong foundation than when they have to um, uh, when they're a little bit older. 
So I'm guessing the sponge analogy of why you start as young as two to 10. Yes, exactly. Exactly. It's a brain science around uh, language acquisition is that um, our, our brains are, are naturally wiring to whatever language input is, is put towards us. And so long as that input is comprehensible, we're able to uh, make connections with uh, sort of our, our native language and the target language. And um, the, 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 these kids are amazing. They can go through a, you know, a single story of ours and by the end of it have uh, essentially um, subconsciously you know, developed connections that they can, um, they can already begin to use um, without, within a story or two. It always amazes me that people can like go switch from like Spanish to English to French, like this on a dime, right? And just seamlessly speak all three languages, talk to different people. Yeah. That's, that's always just amazes me. Yeah, I think, you know, they've, they've wired their brain at an early age. They wired their brain at an early age. And the other interesting thing about this um, that I, that I want to make a point is that when you get to a child early with language learning, they develop a confidence um, and they develop a curiosity in languages. So they start to think that they're good at languages, right? And if, you're, if you feel like you're good at something, you kind of want to do more at it. Um, and you become curious about how you can get better. Uh, so I, I believe that, you know, and the other thing we're doing, right, is we're, we're creating curiosity in cultures. We're creating familiarity in cultures. The stories that, that we have on our platform are culturally rev relevant. They've been written and illustrated by you know, local native speakers in that particular language. So Spanish speakers from, uh, you know, either Spain or Latin America are the writers and illustrators of our particular stories. So you're getting a little bit of the, you know, the, the, the cultural uh, uh, influence in these particular stories, which who knows, this may be something that, uh, you know, impacts a child as they get older and they decide they want to study abroad or they want to work abroad or whatever. They'll have the confidence and the curiosity to do that. So Mark, I think the saying is you can't teach an old dog new tricks. <laughs> is that true for language? Can someone be like 50, 60, 70 and learn a new language? Well, I, I believe, you know, I believe you can. I just believe it's, 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 it's a little bit more challenging. Um, if you haven't been exposed to it at a, at a young age, um, then it's just going to take a little bit more work. But, a, you know, a company like Duolingo does, uh, you know, a, a really good job at um, finding ways to uh, sort of motivate uh, and incentivize adult learners with adult centric game design um, to come back. And a lot, and, and when you need, when, when it's hard, when you're a little bit older and it's a little bit harder, you just need to come back more often and practice more often. So Mark, two part question, who's your target demographic and has that actually been your customer? Great question, great question. So when we set out um, and built this, we, had, we had identified that we wanted to uh, appeal to uh, children between the ages of two and 10. And um, when it came to sort of our Spanish language learning product, we saw two sort of customer archetypes. One customer would be the um, family that had uh, a tie um, through their heritage or culture to the you know, Latino community. So, and therefore they wanted their child to also have uh, that connection to their culture through their language. So that's one side. Then there's the, the other um, uh, customer archetype was the uh, you know, well-educated parent or family that saw, that, that believed that you know, language learning um, has a tremendous impact on the cognitive development of their child, the emotional development on their child, and would give their child a bit of an advantage, you know, an edge uh, in life as they, uh, as they grew in they whatever academic or professional pursuits. So those are the, the two archetypes that we had identified through our customer discovery study. Um, we thought that the age group would skew to a little bit younger, you know, two to six, what we're finding is that um, our stories and our game design is really appealing a little bit higher than that. It's about five years old up to sort of nine years old. These kids get the sort of reward system. And even though the, 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 the content is a little bit more childlike for a nine-year-old, when it comes to learning a language, that childlike content is unintimidating. And so therefore, it's like, oh, okay, I can do this. I have confidence I can learn this language. This is just a little kid's book, right? Um, nine and 10-year-olds are beginning to read chapter books. But what we're presenting them 
our children's stories, which they might have read in their native language at the age of four, five, six, but in learning a new language, they're, they're finding it to be um, comforting uh, that they can sort of, you, you know, learn this through these, these sort of more childlike stories. So Mark, this is my point of view. I think the education industry is kind of like, you know, like, like not tech savvy, they're kind of slow to bring on change. How are you going to convince like education, you know, school districts and so on and so on, like, you know, bring on your platform? Well, yeah, I, I think historically they've been slow moving. Yes. Um, but I do believe that COVID is changing a lot of minds um, out of necessity. Um, and, you know, the two, so you, you, you know, the notion software is eating the world, correct? Right. Uh, the, the two biggest industries, uh, biggest markets that have, have been where the sort of software penetration is still at in the incipient stages would be the education and the government, right? And so COVID has now accelerated that um, in sort of the education industry. I would argue that, uh, you know, elections <laughs> and uh, COVID uh, and sort of, you know, voting technology, et cetera, is also accelerating that in, in, in the government space, although the government's so huge, this is just one small example. So um, yeah, it's, it's happening. It's absolutely happening. And it, it's going to, I mean, these are, this is trillion dollars uh, uh, industry that is um, going to be revolutionized in a relatively short amount of time uh, because of a, you know, once in a sort of century or lifetime um, episode like this pandemic. Mark, what are you seeing? Do, do certain age groups pick up tech faster, like like two to six versus eighteen to twenty four versus thirty five to forty two? Or if if you're tech savvy, just tech savvy, or does age have to do something with it? Uh, no, I, you know, one of the reasons why um, I, you know, I like our uh, the timing of our particular business in sort of digital learning um, and going direct to the learner is because the you know device penetration is uh, is getting younger and younger and younger. So you know there's you know three four five year old kids who now have their own tablets um, and they have an an intuition um, with technology that they've been trained at a very young age. So I you know I would argue that absolutely the the, the younger the generation and the uh, the the more tech savvy that they are um, and sort of building the appropriate u- user interface and user experience for those kids uh, is becoming more and more sophisticated because of they're, they're increasingly capable. Um, so it's, it's, really, it's really interesting when we think about like our onboarding for our particular app or our product, you know, we're onboarding both the parent and the child. Um, and the child will use their intuition to understand things more quickly than uh, the parent in which we have to sort of spoon feed a little bit more the instructions. Um, because it, 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 it doesn't, it could, it could be a little bit confusing and doesn't come quite so easy. Yeah. We talked earlier about how I'm, I'm impressed by how people like it seamlessly go to language to language. Mm-hmm. I'm equally impressed by, you know, the current upcoming generation, they'll go Snapchat, TikTok, you know, Pinterest. Yeah. Seamlessly. They're talking, you know, like they're talking to one person here, talking to another person here, their video chat and it's all like, you know, seamlessly within minutes. Right. Yeah, I agree. I completely agree. Um, it's certainly a lot more facile than, than I am or ever will be. I look at my uh, 10-year-old and she's more facile than my 13-year-old. And then I look at a five-year-old and they're already, you know, the equivalent to a 10-year-old. So yes, it's, it's, um, it's happening very quickly. So how does the tech work? Is it like an algorithm that does all this stuff or how does that work? The technology behind our, uh, yes. our method? Mm-hmm. Um, well, you know, it, we're at the stage right now that um, we're, we're still, you know, very much um, you know, customizing it um, to get the product right. However, uh, the processes we're, we're building for producing each story are becoming in- increasingly, um, a, we, we're, we're building a sort of an engine so that with, as each new story comes in, it's going to have diverse artwork, diverse illustration, et cetera, but we're building an inventory of sort of the interactions and the uh, page construct, et cetera, so that we can start to slot it in and it becomes much more process driven. In terms of the of of understanding how to apply sort of the, the methodology to the language, yes, it's algorithmically 
uh, been developed by my my co-founder. Um, she's the one who had has sort of the uh, simultaneous translation background. And so that uh, intuition, um, we're now building sort of an algorithm around that that we can apply to stories um, and make it a much more um, you know automated process. Um, but at this point, you know you're you're still it's still a hand made type of uh, experience because until you really get it right, right, then you then you can start to build systems around it. So correct me if I, if I ask this question wrong, but Spanish is a pretty big language, right? Correct. How do you work, you know, how people speak in Spanish in Spain versus how they speak in yeah. Puerto Rico versus Mexico versus other parts of the world? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and people feel very passionately about that, <laughs> let me tell you. Um, and so what we try to do is we try to um, provide as diverse uh, a, a collection of content as possible. So we have writers and illustrators from Argentina, from Mexico, from Colombia, um, from Spain. Um, and uh, we really want a, a you know, a, a Spanish speaker, somebody who's being introduced to that particular language to understand that there's a, you know, diversity of, uh, you know, quasi dialects within the Spanish language. Um, so, yeah, we, we, uh, we, we play to no favorite. Um, and we, we, we certainly don't believe that there's uh, any uh, one correct uh, particular way of, of, uh, of, of, uh, of speaking Spanish. So we provide, try to provide as much diverse, authentic content as possible. So Mark, earlier you talked about companies making an impact. What impact would you want your company to have? What's your vision for your company? We, we, our, our impact from, from the outset is um, we believe that uh, having, um, being fluent in another language or being bilingual or, or having proficiency in a, in a second language um, is the, sets the foundation for empathy. And so uh, we want um, kids, um, we want to make it, you know, fun and easy for kids uh, to learn a second language so that future generations can have the um, benefits of, you know, a multicultural perspective, um, a diverse perspective, empathy to other cultures. And we believe that that comes through uh, the understanding and appreciation that um, there are more than your own language out there in the world. And therefore, there are more perspectives on, for example, this bottle. This bottle is, um, is a, a botella or in, in Spanish. And so if a, if a child at a, at, a, at a young age understands that there's two ways to, to make reference to this particular object, they understand that there's, there's more than one perspective and nobody has a monopoly on the truth. And Mark, you're headquartered out of Austin, Texas, correct? Yes. yes. Can you talk a little bit about the current Austin startup in Texas? Yeah, sure. Um, it's, uh, it's vibrant. I, you know, I think it, it, historically it's been uh, more of a, of, of a SaaS slash, you know, enterprise, um, software business, uh, space, but I think increasingly there are, um, great, uh, consumer brands that are being, um, built. There's the, certainly the consumer packaged goods, uh, market in Austin has has been exploding and they do an unbelievable job, but we're also starting to see more, uh, sort of say consumer facing, um, you know, software companies and software development companies that are emerging here. So um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's drawing uh, the, the, the biggest technology companies in the world uh, to create campus. We've got an uh, unbelievable university here um, that uh, provides uh, talented, um, intelligent, um, you know, young professionals um, that are, uh, that are doing all sorts of different things. Um, it's a very uh, entrepreneurial uh, environment. Um, our music scene, our restaurant scene, it's got, uh, you know, there's a, a creative um, a, a space or there's, a, there's appreciation for the creatives here in Austin as well. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a very, very fertile environment for um, these type of progressive forward thinking, lateral thinking, groundbreaking companies to come in and feel welcome. And we can't forget about the food, right? <laughs> yeah, can't forget about the food. I love Mexican food, have all my life and, and barbecue, um, you know, and it's, 
it's certainly got that going. But now, um, you know, as we become, as we gain uh, more and more uh, new Austinites from other parts of the world, um, they're bringing their interests and tastes in, in uh, diverse uh, food as well. So all of a sudden now we're getting, you know, great Italian or sushi um, or all sorts of different uh, fare. Yeah, my family took me to Salt Lake the, about a weekend ago. Nice. It was like a two hour wait. I'm like, man, I can't believe this is actually worth their wait. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, and and you can sit out in, in the garden and, and wait and talk to people and catch up and visit, which is uh, <laughs> kind of feels like you're on the front porch. So you brought up the local university at UT. I don't know if people realize how many colleges, how much talent is in, you know, the San Antonio Austin area, right? Yeah. I mean, San Antonio is like UTSA, Trinity. Yeah. You know, UT Austin has, I mean, UT, I mean, Tech, Austin has like, you know, uh, uh, what's called St. Edwards, mm -hmm. Houston, Tolston, and Baylor's just for the road. Yeah. All this talent right here, and people don't—I don't know if people would realize it unless they're from this area. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a. There's a tremendous amount of um, uh, education institutions that have come. Uh, one from the UT network, but then there's also, you know, other private institutions as well. Yeah, it's so. Yeah, I went to school up in in Boston, and and of course, you know, they have, uh, you know, so, so many. Um, you know, colleges and universities in a relatively concentrated space. I think um, Texas and the University of Texas network is is fantastic, uh, and really, a student can find can find many different options um, and a right fit for them, uh, be it a small or local, um, or to be the big university in Austin. So, yeah. So, a COVID on is your company fully remote now? We have been remote. Yes, you know, we were. Um, we we initially operated more or less remote. We would meet a couple times a week for several hours uh, for sort of either you know uh, a powwow where we were meeting on sort of specific a specific agenda, or we'd get together um, just in kind of a co-working vein, just so we could you know have more of a uh, idea bouncing banter situation. But for the most part, our employees um, have worked from their sort of home offices. I think in the future. What I'm interested in is is sort of a you know a flex space essentially where um, employees who prefer to get up and go uh, work in a more of an office environment get out of their home you know and develop a routine around that can do so um, or if they want to work from home they can do that as well and there because there's some of our uh, some of our employees much prefer their their home office setup and others I find the creatives like to get together and spend um, time uh, sort of brainstorming and, and uh, are a little bit more social in that respect. So Mark, you know, of course, remote work is like the hottest thing now, but I'm a firm believer remote work is enough for everyone. Yeah. How do you personally make sure it, someone can handle remote work? I, I think uh, it's, 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 um, it's, it's challenging now that uh, we are essentially uh, as a result of COVID, it's, um, you know, it's, it's very difficult to get together with other people. Um, but what we do um, is that we still try to organize sort of, you know, socially distance uh, events um, every couple of weeks. And I say event, even if it's just something co-working. Frankly, if it's in my, on my back patio, you know, around uh, two large tables where we're all socially distanced, but at least we can see each other and talk to each other. And, you know, we'll order pizzas or do something that's, that's sort of responsible and, and, and careful, um, but uh, allows for some social interaction. And I think that sort of recharges batteries and refreshes and also creates a kind of connection or maintains a kind of connection that you wanna have um, with your fellow employees. I think just in these isolated chambers, I, I think it would be uh, hard, um, particularly if you're somebody who it doesn't work well that way. Like like myself, I consider myself introvert, but even me, I was like, okay, this is too much. I got to go talk to someone. <laughs> like, I, I, you know, I'm an introvert, man. This is too much. Now I got I to yeah. get some social interaction now. Yeah. Yeah. You know, some days I want to be, um, I want to go into a room where I will not be distracted the entire day because um, I know that the specific task that I have at hand requires, you know, really concentrated focus at a, for a lengthy amount of time. Um, however, there's other days when I want my work to be more collaborative. And so that's why I think the, the notion of having flexibility 
within the workspace when we get out of the sort of COVID uh, environment will, is something that I'm, I'm excited about. So Mark, I'm sure you get you know, lots and lots of emails, phone calls every day asking for help or you know to pick your brain, mm -hmm. in your case maybe. How do you decide which ones to engage with and which one like kind of like you know maybe ignore? I I try not to ignore any of them, to be honest, if they're if they're earnest. If they're you know, if their intent is to solicit my business, uh, then you know, I'd say half the time I say thanks but no thanks, and the other half I ignore. But if it's someone genuinely reaching out for some you know, advice or to be put in touch with someone, et cetera. I've had uh, so many people uh, that I've reached out to that have uh, helped me um, that um, I, I valued the fact that they would take their time to do that, um, that I feel like I need to pay it forward. And then I've had a lot of people that I've reached out to that have not, that I've uh, felt <laughs> was, you know, I felt uh perhaps unjustly but sort of cruelly hurt or frustrated by that action so for me as long as i can figure out a way to make time and i try to um yeah I try to i try to help i, I, I really do i really do and I, you know maybe there'll be a, a, a day when i get so incredibly busy and my time is so incredibly valuable that i that i'll think that oh, maybe i can't get to that but i hope that um i hope that that doesn't happen it really, it means so much when you're genuinely looking for a contact or advice or support um, and somebody uh, recognizes that and provides it. Um, I think that's a really important thing to offer if you can. So Mark, how do you do your like your week to week or day to day schedule? You just wake up in the day and just wing it? Do you have a plan? Do you, like, how do you go about doing that? <laughs> I have, I, have a, I have a plan um, and it starts with really sort of Sunday, understanding what I wanna accomplish that week tactically, and then also sort of what's happening big picture strategically. And then I have um, essentially, I, I sort of schedule out my week um, with, uh, through a combination of sort of work tasks uh, and also sort of the meetings that are, are set. But I know, you know, Sunday night what's happening and then, um, I will get in Monday morning, uh, look at what that task list is, knock it out, um, have some time to be able to work and talk and speak to the team, think strategically. That evening, I look at what's up the next day, what I have to revise and do, et cetera. And of course, you know, it's a dynamic situation. But yes, I like, you know, I, I, I have, in order for me to um, be as productive as I can be, uh, I'm a, I'm somebody who likes to sort of schedule, be a scheduled and regimented and know what, what I want to accomplish and tick off that particular day. I have, a, you know, I journal uh, uh, every once in a while. Sometimes I'll, I'll journal every day for, for several months and sometimes it, you know, I, I get out of the habit. But what I, what I, when I do, one of the things I say is I say, you know, what, are, what I sort of think about what, what would make today a successful day? And then I try to write down I write down sort of three things um, or five things if I'm feeling like it. what would make today successful. And then I, I think about that and that's typically a part of my schedule or itinerary. And then I, that's an important way to look at the day. I like to finish a day thinking that maybe I didn't win, you know, um, but I moved the ball forward. So Mark, I think some people like take pride of working eight hour weeks. Others take weekends off. I have one friend who, who worked 21 straight days, take four days off. Yeah. What's your method for that? Um, you know, it's when you're when you're in startup mode, it's it's really seven days a week. When, whenever you can get to the work, you're working. Um, it's hard to be a parent and a and a husband and all those kind of things when that's your mode. So the breaks that I take are typically to either support my family or to be a you know, a decent spouse. Um, but beyond that, I'm either always, or to exercise, frankly. Beyond that, I'm either always thinking about it or doing something um, towards that. Now, at, at, you know, and I, I don't, you know, how, as that evolves over time, depends upon how your organization evolves and how your team evolves. But um, there's not a whole lot of, 
this notion of, of, of work-life balance. You're just, you're just living and you're living as an entrepreneur. You're living as a husband. You're living as a, as a, as a parent. You're living as a brother, sister, whatever it may be. Um, and that's what you do. Mark, can you talk about exercising? Um, can you talk about any other tips you do to take care of your wellness and make sure you're in the right mind all the time? Right. For me, it's, it's absolutely exercise. Um, it's where I do my best thinking as well, but it's also massive stress release. I, uh, I've typically been somebody that, that likes to jog or run. And so that's somewhere between sort of 30 minutes and an hour every couple of days or so. And that's incredibly sort of nourishing um, for me. Um, I've also uh, tried, you know, Leslie does yoga and we've got a great friend who's invited us to do that. I've been doing some of that re recently. And I, as I've gotten older, man, it's incredible how good that is for your joints. It's incredible. I, I, I never probably gave it enough sort of credit. Now I'm really appreciating that. Um, I, I think it's also important during the day, at least once to sort of take a break and do something mindless, whether that's reading a book or watching a show or listening to a podcast or laughing or going and having a coffee or a beer or something with your friends. I, I think you, you need to, uh, if you can, consistently every day, uh, take 30 minutes or an hour or whatever to, uh, to mentally, emotionally to detach from, from the work that you're doing and from the responsibilities you have as a, as a, you know, as a human being in a family, as a parent or whatever, you just need to kind of detach, and decompress. So Mark, once again, my opinion, but I think a lot of star founders, they kind of, they kind of this thing where they're, when they're instead of working on startup, they're more involved like networking, right? They, they're more involved they're playing the startup game, so to speak, right? Mm. What, how can you keep someone from falling into that trap? Well, I mean, if you're going to be successful, it's because your product or your service is successful. In the end, you can fake your way for only so long. Um, and that includes, you know, raising a whole bunch of money. Um, your, your product, or your service has to work. And the only way that your product or service can work is if you, is if you work on your product or service and perfect it and listen to your customers and work with your team and think strategically. So um, there's the, to me, you know, I'm only going to be networking if in the service of my business. And if that's fundraising, then I'm networking for fundraising. Um, if it's to uh, identify a, a new uh, talented, you know, developer, marketer, or product person, then I'm doing it for that. But it's a, I'm very specific in that purpose. And I don't like to spend a lot of time just showing up to happy hours for this, that, or the other, frankly. Um, if I was looking for a new opportunity, you know, then I would do that, right? I think that's important to network. But once you know what you're building and you know what you need to do, um, then you've got to put your head down and, and get after it and not let other things sort of distract you that are, that are essentially frivolous. So Mark, you know, you always hear, you know, don't give up, keep grinding, you know, go for it, whatever. Yeah. Is there a time when a founder should say, you know what, this isn't working. I'm doing something wrong. I need to, you know, not only pivot, this, this, you know, give it up and start do something else. Sure. Sure. That's a really, really like, I think for somebody who's, you know, like myself, that's, that's just one of the hardest things to do in the world to sort of quit or give up on something. Um, and poof, you know, because so many times you, you've got people that might be, that have, that have been doubting you or, um, or that might tell you that, you know, uh, or they've stopped giving you money or your products, uh, taken in, you know, one step back. Um, so it's, it's a very challenging thing. I think that the, the only thing you can do is, is, you know, there's one, you either run out of money and there's nothing else you can do about it. Um, or two, uh, a, you know, a really trusted, you know, resource or advisor um, or family member one has a, has a genuine authentic conversation with you um, that, you know, helps you see the light. Uh, to try to be dispassionate and entirely sort of objective uh, about looking at your numbers and not thinking that you can sort of improve them because we're, you know, naturally entrepreneurs are, are optimistic by, by nature. Um, 
That's, that's the hardest thing to do in the world. I imagine that there are some people that are um, analytical enough and capable of doing so. Uh, it, it's, it's hard for me. And even though I'm, you know, I come from a finance background, to me more, it, it'll, it, it's going to be a case where you've sort of exhausted all possibilities and you just have to wrap it up. Mark, can you talk some about the pros and cons of having your wife as your co-founder? Sure. Um, well, um, I think the, the, the pros are, in my perspective, is that, you know, she's a, a great compliment in, in, the, um, in the business. Like, uh, I would not be able to do the story curation, the pedagogy development, um, and have such a sort of keen eye for, um, uh, for developing sort of the method and the, behind the product. Um, and, and, and knowing, you know, what stories and why uh, need to be a part of our platform. Um, also developing the relationship she's done with the publishers, et cetera, has been, has been amazing. Um, the, the other, uh, I'd say pros is that you're really sharing something really important to you. So there's a, a strong bond that forms um, as a result of that. And there's nothing, you know, when, you, <laughs> and when I worked on projects in the past where she wasn't my partner, you know, I would, um, you know, uh, she would be in the dark as to what was going on or what was causing, you know, any sort of, you know, emotional highs or lows with me. She would, and as much as I would, could try to share that, um, it would never be as, as, um, as telling as, as sort of being a part of the business as well. So we share a lot and that's great. So we're on sort of the same page, which is excellent. Um, and we're able to manage our lives, right? You know, if, if she's doing something important, then I need to look after sort of the groceries or the kids or whatever it may be, um, or enrollment in school or this, that, the other, or parents or family. If, if I'm on something focused, she can, she can take up that uh, role and responsibility. So we ham and egg it really well and understand why. The cons, of course, is that, you know, you're, there's, there's no escaping um, the emotional highs and lows of your business. Um, and when things are going well, of course, you know, everything's going well, but when things are tough, you know, you can't, you don't come home from it to a, uh, a, a place where it's a sanctuary um, from the stress that you have uh, in, this, in this other spot. So that's a, that's a real challenge. It's, there is no uh, sort of sanctuary from the, the stress that, that you might be feeling um otherwise so on linkedin i think it says you have nine employees that work for your company is, is that correct uh yes so what's the dynamic dynamic being for your employees knowing that you know the co-founders are married <laughs> gosh that's interesting i you know uh, obviously we're um yeah you know, i have to ask them more than anything but i'll tell you what my impression is um they first of all they they knew that coming in and they signed on um, to be a part of it. Uh, I think, you know, Leslie and I are very transparent um, about, you know, we, we will argue with each other in front of them. Uh, we will agree with each other and support each other in front of them. So I don't believe that they, they, they ever think that there's sort of a um, backroom dealing tag team going on because they hear us, you know, um, argue uh, about uh, different points that, that we want to make. We, and when we have, you know, I, I believe very much in this idea that, um, you know, there needs to be great arguments and, and confrontation around ideas and objectives and strategy amongst your sort of founding team to come to the, the, the best solution. And um, Leslie less, less and I are not always on the same side. So I, I think that they believe that, that we're fair. I think that they also respect that we are absolutely invested in this opportunity, that there is um, a unbelievable level of commitment that we've made to this. So they know how passionate we are around the mission and how much success, uh, you know, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, is critical um, to, uh, to what we're doing because of how much, you know, we've, we've put into this. Mark, do you ever see yourself going back to corporate America or you're an entrepreneur for life, as they say? I think it would be very difficult to go back to corporate America, but uh, unless they had sort of a, you know, 
a entrepreneurial opportunity within um, their organization where they wanted to try sort of a new strategy or a new idea, et cetera. But I, and I do think that that's happening more and more in corporate America. Um, but yes, I love, I love the, uh, the building. I um, appreciate the risk reward. Um, I've now done this enough to where I can um, weather the highs and lows a little bit better and stay more even keel um, than I could in the past. So I think now, and I've got the scar tissue around sort of success and failure. Um, so, so, I, so I think this is, a, this is a good place for me right now. So Mark, back to your company. Is there somewhere to tell when someone starts your, 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 using your platform, if they're gonna quickly pick it up faster than other people or how does that work? We, um, you mean, is there a way to tell whether it's going to be more or less effective yes. for the, 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 the different users? Yes. Um, we have uh, within the stories uh, comprehension game. So the, the story, each story can be done five different ways, essentially five different levels. Um, the first level, it's narrated to you. The second level, you practice your pronunciation. The third level, there are comprehension games, which are based upon what you've learned uh, in going through the story and interacting with the story. In those comprehension games, <clears throat> we have a, a good indication as to how much of the, um, of the subconscious invisible learning is happening with that particular child in that particular story. It may be that that story is a bit too advanced for that child, and so we need to route them to a more of a beginner story. It may be that that child has you know, mastered it quite quickly, um, and so therefore we need to route them towards a, a more advanced story because their level of proficiency is growing. So Mark, how does your platform work with kids who would like to have like autism or dyslexia or some or learning disability, so to speak? Yes. So um, the, the cool thing uh, that we've found, uh, and this is unintentionally, is that uh, children with uh, you know, learning challenges, um, that the ways in which we, um, the ways in which we present the text and the narration and the ability to touch the text and to hear the words and to hear the syllabic breakdown of each one of these words is really beneficial and helpful um, for, these, for the children with certain types of, uh, of disability, um, such as autism and or dyslexia. Um, the interactivity that happens on each page where if you touch a tree, you're going to hear arbol, tree. Um, you touch a flower, floor, flower. Uh, these, this type of tactile, um, uh, interactivity is, um, there's really strong evidence in learning science that this is the sort of progressive way um, to, to teach children now um, versus a more of a traditional uh, memorization um, or sort of rule-based uh, pedagogy. So. so Mark, can you talk about the business model? It's like a subscription base. They might pay one fee for the whole course. How does that work? Sure. So the business model is subscription based. And what we have is we have, we release new stories on a very regular basis. So if you're a subscriber, uh, you can either subscribe monthly or semi-annual or annual with discounts associated with those two too. Um, and each month um, or every several weeks, um, you're going to get, you know, a, a new story to enjoy. And we're going to add new games and we add new features in our sort of what we call our fabulingua overworld where as you achieve uh, and finish different stories, master these stories, you earn a sort of a currency or stickers that you can go enjoy as well. So um, that, that's, that's the business model. Mark, can you talk about some feedback you've gotten, whether it's good or bad that maybe you were not expecting? Um, yes. So when we first did our customer discovery study, um, what we learned from uh, the parents was that they wanted uh, a higher level of interactivity. They, were, they did not want their child to be uh, learning in any sort of passive environment. They'd, it would make a big difference to them if they saw their, their, their kids um, both interacting tactilely with the, the tablet or the phone in the app and or recording with the pronunciation, the copycat sort of mode that I mentioned earlier. So that was something that we thought, okay, we need to lean into that. And then we also recognized at that point that we needed to build more sort of game design elements within the particular story um, or within the, the, the entire platform itself. 
keep the kids engaged because parents did not want to have to tell their child, hey, you know, go practice your piano. You're supposed to practice every day for 30 minutes. Um, or go play Fabulingua. You're supposed to play, you know, every day for 15 minutes. They wanted the child to be drawn to that themselves. Um, that was their ideal scenario. So that's when we decided, okay, we've got to introduce a, a greater element of our activity to pull the child back into the, um, into the story. The other thing that we learned just recently is that, you know, onboarding is a, and is a, is such a critical part of, um, of, of your quote unquote customer funnel. So, you know, you get a, an individual is interested in language learning through stories and they may download the app. Well, as soon as they open that app, it is so critical in a very short period of time within only a few steps to be able to uh, demonstrate what the app is all about and to get uh, a, a customer or a user engaged uh, in participating and take and following through with sort of the, um, the tutorial around the app. And so that's something we've learned over time and have, have made significant improvements to that element of our app. And I'm guessing you're on, you're on Android and iOS? That's correct. And so how was this? I, I think they both charge like 30%. Do you have to pay that fee or is that? Yes, yes, how absolutely. Does that work? So is the that... way it works with subscriptions is that, yes, it's 30% for the first year that a user is with you. But if you're able to maintain that user's, retain that user um, um, more than one year, it drops to 15%. So okay. you sign up, you know, Jason Amara, and um, I'm charged 30% for, uh, for the subscription fee that you've paid me. But um, in 366 days, uh, when you decide to resubscribe, I'm only charged 15%. So even a greater reason to focus on customer retention, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So Mark, I understand you have something for our listeners today. Yes, I do. Well, I was um, telling Jason earlier that they, what I'm really interested in is, is, uh, is getting you know, you know, more uh, eager language learners on the platform. So um, we're, uh, if you send uh, a, an email to info at fabulingua.com, info at fabulingua.com, I-N-F-O at fabulingua.com, and that is F-A-B-U-L-I-N-G-U-A.com. Um, and let us know that you're interested in a uh, six months uh, free uh, with, with Fabulingua, then we will offer you um, six months free full access to Fabulingua and all of the new releases and all the stories and all the features. Um, and we'd love to, uh, to have you enjoying our product and learning a language. Mark, can you share your social media for both yourself and your company so people can reach out to you? Yes, Instagram is at Fabulingua Kids. And Facebook is Fabulingua. And for listeners, we have the link to his gift and his social media on the show notes. You can find the show notes at www.cavernchrblog.com. And be sure to share this episode with your friends. So, Mark, we'll come to the end of our episode. Can you give us any advice or wisdom or anything you want to talk about? Well, I, I look, I, I think that, um, first of all, what you're doing is fantastic. You ask really good questions. And uh, I think anybody that, that listens to these, this podcast or, or other podcasts where you've had some great guests, um, you know, has the opportunity to learn some, some unique things that don't always, uh, don't always uh, come out in an interview. Um, from, from, from our perspective, I would just encourage, you know, parents, um, uh, uncles, aunts, grandparents um, to give the gift of language learning um, to their kids, nephews, and grandkids. Um, and we'd loved it to be through Fabulingua, but, you know, if there are other ways that, that are suitable as well, uh, you know, there's, it's, it's something that I believe uh, benefits uh, these children so much in terms of developing perspective and empathy um, in our world, which, uh, you know, is, is something that's going to sort of benefit generations for years to come. So, um, if you want to learn more about uh, our particular method um, and you want to see some examples of the stories that we have um, and understand the brain science and the learning science behind language learning in general, then I would really recommend you go to our website, which we've recently redone, um, actually just before this show. Um, it's www.fabulingua.com. Um, and fabulingua.com has great resources around 
how it works, our stories method um, that I think should uh, get people excited about um, their, their children learning a second language. So Mark, I thought of one more question. Yes, sir. Is there something out there shown that if you know two or more languages, your potential for income revenue increases? Absolutely. Well, absolutely. So uh, certainly in Asia, in Latin America, and frankly, uh, a, a lot of it has to do with uh, English language learning, but there in Latin America, you can earn up to 30% more if you understand, um, if you have langu uh, English language skills in addition to your Spanish language skills. And in China, um, it's up to, uh, you know, 200% um, increase in sort of the average salary um, by, by knowing more than one language and that second language being, being English. No, not too shabby, 200%. No, not at all, not at all. Mark, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. This is great. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.